Hi, everybody. My name is Caroline Schumannix. I am the Chief Administrative Officer with Ideas for Us, and we're here today with the Ideas Hive St. Pete for our August month, all about our world's oceans, and specifically about sharks. So if you are a lover of sharks, or maybe you're a little bit fearful of them, hopefully this presentation will inspire you to learn more about these really important species that we have on our planet and what you can do to get involved to shape to save our shark species around the world through some local actions um, that you can even take um, action in online. So we're really excited about today's presentation. We do have a fun game at the beginning. So if you do have a piece of paper and something to write with handy, you can be involved with that. If not, no worries. And then at the end of the presentation, we're going to be having a fun Q&A. So if you've ever had a question about a shark or the shark trade, or about our world's oceans. Um, we have our expert here today from Oceana to help answer some of your questions. So we're in for a treat today. Um, this will also be shared on our YouTube page after the presentation is over. So thanks for joining us. So we always like to spotlight um, one of uh, the local nonprofit organizations or businesses that are doing great things in the community. So today we are shouting out Kids Saving Oceans. Um, Kids Saving Oceans was started by a really incredible um, now eight-year-old um, named Miles in 2018 with only $13. He sells clothing and accessories from recycled and sustainable materials with all proceeds going to local nonprofits that protect our planet. So you can check out kidsavingoceans.com to see what this incredible um, member of our youth is doing to save oceans. Also, a little sustainability tip. Um, if you are an eco-friendly person like us, um, you might have seen masks and um, single-use gloves being thrown around our communities and um, being a form of littering. So we really encourage you to wear reusable masks. And there's also some local places in St. Pete that you can um, check out to support a local business. Um, you can go to ilovetheberg.com. They have an article called Three Ways You Can Get a Mask right now in St. Pete. Um, and also you can get rewarded by Keep Pinellas Beautiful by picking up discarded masks um, that you see on the ground. And we're gonna have a little bit more information at the end of this presentation um, regarding our eco action of the month um, that will share more information about that. So Ideas for Us is an environmental nonprofit. We develop, fund, and scale environmental solutions to the world's most pressing environmental challenges. And that is associated with the focus areas of ecology, water, energy, food, and waste. So every single month, we are boots on the ground action in one of these categories at all of our branches here in Florida and also internationally around the world. Um, these focus areas um, are the topic of our Hive presentation, so like the Hive that you're watching right now. And some of the topics that we'll talk about are like energy with solar energy, um, food with urban agriculture, waste with waste audits, tree plantings with ecology, and shoreline native landscaping restoration projects with our water focuses of the month. So every month we talk about one of these topics and we engage in an action project to quickly put what we learned into action within our own communities. All of our presentations or eco action days are associated with the sustainable development goals created by the United Nations. These are 17 goals that really help local areas develop and um, align their work with the global goals that other countries um, are working towards together. So today we're going to be talking about one of these in particular, life below water. The Hive, the Solutions Fund, and Fleet Farming are all part of Ideas for Us. Ideas really start in the Ideas Hive through conversations about our focus areas and different environmental challenges that our communities may face. Um, through that, we're able to um, really plan out really fun eco action projects to get active in the topic of the month. And we can even fund these through the Solutions Fund that have funded programs such as Fleet Farming. If you haven't heard of Fleet Farming before, Fleet Farming is an urban agriculture program of Ideas for Us that transforms the average American lawn into a productive micro farm or what we call a farmlet. And so this is an example of what we can really do when we come together around a problem or a challenge in our community and what we can create out of, out of that together to create a new form of sustainability. 
So every month we meet every first Monday of the month. We have just started back up after our um, quarantine break. So thank you for joining us and being patient with us. Um, we usually meet on every first Monday of the month. And our action projects can be virtual now or in person, um, but we will be doing virtual events for the foreseeable future um, that are usually the last Saturday of the month. But luckily, like today, we have some online action items that you can take action in today, right after this presentation. If you see value in what we do, we do ask you to support by a donation. You can do this um, online at ideasforus.org slash donate. Um, you can even go to the branches tab and specifically donate to the St. Pete branch so we can do more eco action projects directly in the St. Pete community. And if you really love us, you can join us as a member. Memberships are a great way for you to earn some awesome um, benefits while supporting our nonprofit organization that's doing environmental work. So at ideasforus.org slash memberships, check it out. If you would like to volunteer with us, if you are like us and you have so many ideas of environmental topics that need to be talked about or eco action projects, in the St. Pete area that you think that really should take into effect, you can join our organizing team. We are a group of dedicated individuals that really care about creating environmental programming. Um, you can email us at contact at ideasforus.org and I will personally talk to you and I would love to have a conversation to see about if you would like to join our organiza organizing team. Now I would like to share um, the microphone with Devin. Devin will talk about our SDG Goal 14. So take it away, Devin. Thanks, Caroline. Yep, I'm Devin. I'm uh, one of the volunteer organizers with Ideas for Us. And I'm just going to be giving you a little bit of background on our topic uh, for today, which is the uh, which is goal number 14, life below the water. So the ocean drives global systems that make the earth habitable for humankind. Our rainwater, drinking water, weather, climate, coastlines, a lot of our food, even oxygen uh, in the air that we breathe, are all ultimately provided uh, and regulated by the oceans, by the seas. So careful management of this essential global resource is a key feature of sustainable future. Uh, saving our ocean has to remain a priority. Marine biodiversity is, is critical to the health of both uh, people and our planet. Marine protected areas need to be effectively managed and well resourced and regulations need to be put in place that reduce overfishing, marine pollution, and ocean acidification. And a major part of maintaining the right balance of biodiversity within marine ecosystems is actually done by sharks, which are at the top of the food chain. So by protecting sharks, we are thus allowing them to continue their role of keeping uh, other fish populations at a healthy balance for all species to be able to survive. Uh, oceans and fisheries continue to support the global population's economic social and environmental needs, despite the critical importance of conserving oceans, decades of irresponsible exploitation, including that of sharks for their coveted shark fins that we'll be learning about here tonight, have led to an alarming level of degradation. Uh, current efforts to protect key marine environments and small scale fisheries and to invest in ocean science are not yet meeting the urgent need that safeguard this vast and fra but fragile resource. All right, guys, it's time to pull out the pen and paper that Caroline was, was telling you about. If you don't have pen and paper, that's totally okay. You can just kind of think in your head here too. We like to start our hives with icebreakers uh, that generally relate to our topic. And uh, for this one, we're gonna be playing a little game that we want you all to rank uh, these following items from most to least, uh, basically asking the question uh, globally around the whole world, which of these causes the most deaths per year? That's people deaths uh, specifically. And for bonus points, how many deaths do each of these cause? You'll see that one of the items in here is sharks. So we're basically trying to uh, get, get the point across here. Do sharks kill a lot of people? Do sharks not kill a lot of people? Uh, we're gonna be answering that question. We'll give you about a minute here uh, for you guys to think and try to rank these one to 14, which is the responsible uh, for, for, the, for the most human deaths and which causes the least amount of human deaths. We should have some uh, Jeopardy music playing right now. <laughs> you can all just kind of imagine that in your head here. Do, 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 do. I know some of these look a little silly, but 
you're going to find out very soon just how dangerous some of these silly things could be. So as people are writing it down, I'll just read them off. We have crocodiles, falling out of bed, sharks, humans, homicide, freshwater snails, volcanoes, traffic accidents, champagne corks, lightning, coconuts, mosquitoes, being left-handed, vending machines, and hippos. All very different things. Mm -hmm. So just a couple more seconds to let people write them down. Apologies if we're being too rushed or not rushed enough. <laughs> Hopefully you've all kind of had a chance to at least think, what do you think the top few would be at least and what, and what, what the least few would be? Mm -hmm. What would be near the top? What would be near the bottom? All right, Caroline, what do you think? Should we keep going? I think that we can go ahead and say the answers. All right, here come the answers, everybody. All right, drum roll. Here they are. All right, so number one, traffic accidents with 1,400,000 deaths per year around the world. Mosquitoes is number two. 725,000 people are killed by mosquitoes every year with all the disease that they, that they carry and uh, give to people. Number three, homicide with 475,000. And I need to minimize my picture here so I can see. All right, here we go. Freshwater snails, 10,000. They have parasites that, uh, that, that can transfer to people in water. Uh, being left-handed, 2,500 people die just because they're left-handed. I guess it's not just because they're left-handed, but they're, they're trying to use uh, tools that are meant for right-handed people. And unfortunately, that ends up ending in their demise. Uh, number six, crocodiles, 1,700 deaths. Lightning at 1,000. Next is volcanoes, 762. And this is on average, uh, by the way, not just one specific year. Hippos, 500. 500 people are killed by hippos. Amazingly, 450 people are, are killed by falling out of bed each year. Coconuts, 150 people. Next up, champagne corks. 24 people. Make sure that the next time someone opens up champagne around you that they're not aiming it right at you. And uh, la a second to last, vending machines. Yes, vending machines are more dangerous than sharks. Yet, we do not have vending machine week on the Discovery Channel. We should probably try to uh, petition for that. So yes, sometimes people don't get uh, the, their, 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 their food doesn't come out of the machine when they, when they put their money in. They get upset and they start shaking the machine. Next thing they know, it falls over on them. <coughs> Excuse me. So that is how people end up getting killed by vending machines. And last but not least, we have sharks. Only about 10 people are killed in the entire world every year on average by sharks, despite the millions of people that are in the water every day. There's only about 10, that, 10 people that are killed by sharks. All right. All right, so we're going to jump in and have our awesome guest speaker here, Hunter Miller. We'll be speaking with you guys in just a minute here. But just a quick background on Hunter. Uh, before joining Oceana in 2017, Hunter was an organizer with the Environmental Youth Council in Northeast Florida, where he worked on climate change and sea level rise education. He led campaigns to stop pollution in Florida rivers and helped craft the Young Riverkeeper Program for the Matanzas Riverkeeper. Sorry, Hunter, if I mispronounced that. <clears throat> he led the campaign in his community to engage and educate citizens and local elected officials about the threats of seismic air gun blasting and offshore drilling in the Atlantic to coastal communities. And as a result, the city of St. Augustine and, and St. John's County passed resolutions of opposition, which became blueprints for, for municipalities across Florida to stand up to the oil industry. Hunter is a sixth generation Floridian and has always had a connection to it, to its waters. As an avid fisherman, surfer, and paddler, he found his love and appreciation for our oceans and believes it is his moral obligation to conserve, heal, and protect the waters which have given him so much. Hunter has a degree in public administration from Flagler College in St. Augustine. And when he is not organizing for the environment, you can find him in the nearest body of water with his partner, Jaron and dog Baxter. 
All right, Hunter, take it away. All right. Hey, everybody. Thanks, Devin. Um, I'm just so thrilled to be here. Um, and I'm really glad to be with the Ideas Hives. I, we, I think last year I got to speak in person um, and it was wonderful. And I love the work that you're doing and just really encourage you to continue on that. Um, and despite this difficult time that we're in, I'm really happy to see this monthly meeting um, continue. And yeah, I think it's just, just wonderful. Um, again, my name's Hunter Miller and I'm the Florida Gulf Camp pain organizer for, uh, for Oceana. And if you're unfamiliar with Oceana, we are the world's largest international uh, conservation organization focused solely on oceans. And as an organizer, I have uh, the privilege to get to um, work with coastal communities up and down Florida's Gulf Coast um, and work with groups like the Ideas Hive, uh, local fishing groups, businesses, local elected officials. Um, and really my job is to elevate those voices um, when it comes to protecting and preserving our oceans. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the campaigns that I get to work on, um, uh, some of our US campaigns, um, and then we'll get into the good stuff, which is our, uh, our great shark campaign. So we can move on to the next slide. So first, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about our offshore drilling campaign. Um, so uh, about a year and a half ago, the Trump administration um, uh, proposed opening up all US, nearly all US waters to um, dangerous and dirty offshore drilling. And this was a huge, huge, um, hugely dangerous proposal. Um, not only is it uh, detrimental to marine life, but it also threatens our coastal communities and our, and our tourism based economy here in Florida. And, um, you know, this year marks the 10th anniversaries uh, since the BP Deepwater Horizon disaster. And I can remember watching for days and days um, and weeks and weeks as oil gushed into the Gulf of Mexico, um, leaving a trail of devastation. Um, oiled birds, dead fish, um, racing dolphins, um, and just that, that oil slick and uh, how uh, terrible and sad um, that was. And I think for a lot of Floridians, we haven't forgot that. So thinking about all of our coastlines being proposed for, for offshore oil drilling, um, it's just, we cannot let that happen. Uh, next slide. So um, as an organizer, I've, I've gotten to work again with, with these local communities. Um, we put on events and do tactics like Hands Across the Sand, where we hold hands. And in this photo, I think we had that year, hundreds and hundreds of folks in Indian Rocks Beach. Um, but really what we're trying to do is, is show the uh, solidarity of, of Floridians against this particular issue. And you know when you do events like this, um, and when you speak with communities and, um, and, and work with elected officials, it really um, puts the pressure on our federally elected officials. Next slide. Oh, sure. All right, cool. Sorry. Um, so the, in this picture, it's myself and Congressman Charlie Crist, um, the congressman for Pinellas County. And, you know, as elected officials, you know, I think in Florida, being against offshore drilling is a no brainer. But what we really try to do in, in coastal communities in different congressional districts is to build the power in communities to make them be champions. And so um, champions for our oceans. And so in the case of Congressman Christ, he's been a great champion for our oceans because his constituents care and let him know that it should be a priority for him. And so that's kind of like how um, uh, campaign organizing can really affect change. Um, and so with the help of, of really engaged citizens, we can um, not only defend um, our oceans, but also move forward and protect them and, and do some, play some offense as well. Next slide. 
I know most of the folks that would be watching this, um, this presentation care about the oceans, and I'm sure you are well aware that uh, of the impacts of, from the plastic pollution crisis that is uh, threatening our, our coastal waterways, our marine environment, and our health. Uh, billions and billions of pounds of plastic enter the ocean every year, and uh, it's quite problematic. Um, it's entering into our uh, the food chain. It's uh, just polluting uh, our waters. There's massive plastic gyres that that we've all seen on our on our news feeds um, across uh, our the, the world's oceans, um, and it's only projected to get worse. A new study that came out this month. Um, projects that um, by 2040, uh, the amount of plastic going into our, our oceans is expected to triple. Um, so I think of it in terms of um, over the last couple of years, or, and actually, you know, my adult life going to beach cleanups and things like that and picking up, you know, some cases, sometimes it's hundreds of pounds of mainly single-use plastic and, and marine debris and it's already bad and unacceptable now. We're, we're also seeing um, uh, marine mammals and marine animals um, being caught up with plastic in different forms and ingesting it. Um, so if we think it's bad and unacceptable now, we can only expect this problem to get worse. Um, and Oceana and our, our field team are working in communities. You can go to the next slide, thank you. Um, and we're actually working to on some goals for our plastics campaign. Um, the first is to pass policies to re reduce plastic use. So on the local level, that's something as easy a, a, or as simple as um, ordinances from cities and counties to limit single-use plastics. We are part of the Suncoast Rise Above Plastics Coalition, and we worked with the city of St. Petersburg, and you know, uh, in the last year they've passed and implemented their, um, their ban of single-use straws. And we know straws are, are not the main culprit of marine debris, but um, these are really important steps for cities to pass, um, to pass these ordinances. Um, and they embolden other cities to take action because we know the federal government, it's unlikely that there'll be any meaningful um, uh, legislation passed in the next year or so. Um, so it's up to cities to start leading the way and we've seen that. So, um, you know, happy to work with, with folks if they're in a city and like to see an ordinance get passed. And those policies also extend um, to the state and federal levels. Um, this year, the, the uh, Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act was introduced by Alan Lowenthal in California. It is such an awesome comprehensive plastic pollution bill. Um, I encourage you to look it up um, and ask your, your member of Congress to uh, co-sponsor that bill. It's called the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. It's really fantastic, um, uh, very, very comprehensive. Um, and so it's policies like that that we're working towards and those uh, ordinances, as they spread across America and coastal communities, they're gonna kind of lay the groundwork to say, hey, we can do this. We're already doing this in our own community. So uh, it's important we do those. Uh, until we can get federal legislation passed. The next goal, we are working to create plastic-free zones in universities, workplaces, city parks, different areas like that. Um, and we work uh, with companies and corporations to offer plastic-free choices. Um, in the past month for Plastic Free July, Oceana launched our campaign to get Amazon to offer consumers package-free mailing packaging um, at checkout. So right now, when you go to Amazon, I believe there's a setting that you can set to get plastic free options, but it's really, really difficult to navigate and find. And we want it to be right there at checkout. So we don't have to have all this plastic when we order things from Amazon, which a lot of folks are doing right now um, in this kind of stay home um, time. So um, that's a little bit on our plastic campaign. Next slide, thank you. Um, we also work to um, defend and uh, our, our nation's bedrock ocean conservation laws. So laws that you probably have heard of that we work to defend are the Endangered Species Act or the Marine Mammal Protection Act. 
A lesser known um, law, but equally as important, is the um, Magnuson-Stevens Act. It's our nation's blue ribbon ocean uh, science-based uh, uh, fisheries management law. Um, it's really important. Um, a lot of people haven't heard of it, but it allows us to, um, to have sustainable fisheries so future generations have access to fish um, and that we can continue to, to sustainably um, harvest fish at a rate where we're not crashing fish stocks. Um, and so just like so many of our, of our very important ocean conservation laws, there are efforts to weaken them um, and leaving them um, kind of toothless. Um, so really important that we defend um, science and some of these management laws um, and that the Magnus and Stevens Act stays strong so we can have healthy and abundant oceans. Next slide. Just some, some examples. Um, the MSA requires the rebuilding of uh, overfished uh, fish stocks. Um, so for the Gulf of Mexico, um, you can see the gag grouper. Um, they put a, a rebuilding timeline um, uh, for the gag grouper. So they, they kind of halted fishing or capped fishing for gag. And you saw a 280% increase um, in that fish stock from 2007 to 2015. So the MSA works. It's a, a really wonderful tool. Um, it's emulated by other countries all over the world. And it's a, a science-based uh, way of managing our fisheries so that we can have healthy and abundant oceans. Next slide. All right, so I'm really, really excited, um, especially as we're entering into Shark Week, which is one of my favorite weeks because um, it lets us shine a light on these incredible, um, incredible animals. Um, before I started working with Oceana, I always liked sharks. I was terrified of the movie Jaws as a child. Um, but having sometimes when you advocate for a certain species, you really get an affinity for them. And it's not just um, reading and watching videos and um, studying sharks. It's also meeting incredible people from around the world, really, um, who have intimate relationships with sharks, whether it's their business to take folks to experience sharks firsthand, um, whether they're scientists that have devoted their life to study how we can save these amazing creatures, um, or just advocates that are relentless in their pursuit to protect um, to protect sharks. But really, um, personally, I love working on this campaign because I have grown into such a shark lover. But unfortunately, um, sharks are having a rough time. Uh, and in many cases, um, they're feeling the pinch and seeing major, major decline. Uh, one of the greatest threats to sharks uh, is their demand for their fins. So in fact, uh, as many as 73 million sharks end up in the global shark fin trade every year. Um, this leads to the act of shark finning, which is cutting off the dorsal fins or the fins of the sharks and discarding the body, body at sea where it could drown, bleed to death, or even be eaten alive by other fish. Um, it's really a disturbing practice. Um, it is really important to note that shark finning is in fact illegal in the US. Um, a lot of people get that confused, but shark finning is illegal in the US, but the trade and sale is not. And that's a really important factor. So we, as the US, we still contribute to this trade um, that's having such a negative impact on sharks. And we still um, act as a, a transshipment hub um, so we're, we're still getting fins from uh, many countries that um, may have little to no finning regulations. And the fins that we get, there's really no way to tell if those fins are from a threatened or endangered species. Next slide. So before we get too deep into it, I want to just talk a little bit about sharks. And um, sharks are really, really old. Um, they're among the oldest living vertebrate predators on the, on the planet, um, originating around 420 million years ago. Um, 
420 million years is a huge, it's like a massive number, but to give you perspective, um, that's almost 200 million years before dinosaurs, dinosaurs walked the earth. So they've been around here. They are very OG in the oceans uh, and are on our planet. Um, there are about 450 shark species in the world. Um, in 2017, the U.S. landed over 20 species in, uh, of shark in commercial fisheries. Um, but sharks are particularly uh, vulnerable to, to over-exploitation. Um, many of the sharks that are uh, targeted for their fins um, have long lifespans. They mature slowly and they produce relatively few offspring. Um, this makes them particularly slow to recover um, from any added mortalities like uh, unsustainable fishing. Um, so we look, if you look at a comparison of 26 shark populations compared to 151 um, other fish populations, we determined that sharks face twice the risk of extinction resulting from uh, fishing pressure uh, than other fish. And that's really just because they they mature so so slowly and re reproduce um, with so few offspring, um, and we we see this play out. You know, when we're taking sharks faster out of out of the ocean faster than they can reproduce, we see this pl play out in massive uh, decline in shark populations. Some shark have declined by more than ninety percent. For example, in the United States, the oceanic white tip, hammerheads, and the dusky shark have suffered the most extreme population declines. Um, the oceanic white tip is listed as a is listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. Um, is one of the most popular species of shark in the uh, international fin trade, and their populations have declined up to or more than um, seventy to eighty percent in most areas where they're found. So, some of our most iconic shark species are having just huge, huge um, declines in population. The more that you take out of this of uh, the population, the harder it is to rebuild that uh, that population, um, and the longer it takes. So, um, so really concerning about about sharks. Next slide. So sharks are not only cruel; they're not only uh, super old, um, and they're not only in trouble, but they they're also very very important. As Devin mentioned early earlier. They're so important to ocean ecosystems. They play a variety of roles um, in our ocean ecosystems throughout the world, including as predator and prey. Um, and these, these roles help structure uh, marine food webs and they increase uh, different uh, ecosystems biodiversity um, by removing sick, uh, sick and weak individuals from prey populations. Um, they even contribute to the protection of those ecosystems that serve as carbon sinks to um, slow global climate change. Um, so, you know, they're, they're so important. It seems like removing the top predator, you think, oh my gosh, well, there'll be more fish. Um, but it actually is the opposite. Oftentimes where there's more sharks, there's often more di biodiversity and, and healthier fish stocks. Um, and that whole chain, food chain is important, uh, especially at the top. Next slide. Uh, you know, I said this statistic earlier, but I think it, it bears repeating. Um, fins from as many as 73 million sharks end up in the global fin trade every year. Um, and it's such a staggering number. Um, and and you, you see that number and you think, of course, how could this ever be sustainable? How can our children, when they're our age, you know, be able to experience, you know, our ocean's abundance the way we did if, if we are if we're doing this. Um, and it's it's so concerning. And it's also, we haven't really touched on this, but you know, the reason why we're harvesting, we're seeing so many fin sharks killed for their fins is largely due to the demand for shark fin soup, um, which is uh, a delicacy in, in certain Asian countries and cultures. Um, and you're seeing a lot of pushback from that, but it's kind of unconscionable to think about 
you know, some of our most amazing shark species like the hammerhead or, or oceanic white tips leaving the earth forever because of a demand for soup. I mean, it blows my mind every day. Um, and I think that the U.S. has a really great opportunity to take a stand against um, against this demand for fins. And, um, and we'll talk more about that. Next slide. More than 70% of the most popular species that end up in the fin trade face the threat of extinction. And, you know, I can show you slide after slide of insane um, scenes of sharks being mutilated uh, uh, at sea and binning it occurring or shark markets. It's just so upsetting um, and obviously unsustainable. Um, but a really important point is that um, the species that end up in this trade often are looking at a future of extinction. Next slide. So uh, again, this, this slide is, is fairly uh, obvious, but, um, but the fins from the shark is where all the value is for, for many shark fishermen, um, I think domestically and, and around the world. So for, for, for fisher folk globally in, in an area that may not have any shark finning regulations, it's a lot more cost effective than for them if 90% of the value is in the fins um, to cut the fins off and discard the body because uh, a big shark takes up a lot of space. So if you can just do that, then you're, you're saving yourself time um, and you're creating more space for more fins and the cycle continues. So um, really uh, shark fishermen, um, illegal shark fishing or uh, unsustainable shark fishing, you know, where, there, where there's finning occurring, they're getting those fins, but, but all the value, um, nearly all the value around the world is gonna be in the fins, not the actual shark meat. Next slide. And you can click three times there, yeah. So um, there's some really good news. I think some um, some news about um, the movement to get out of this fin trade. Uh, major corporations like Amazon um, and Disney um, have uh, committed to uh, be opposed to this practice and 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 not they're not um, participating in uh, the shark fin trade. Uh, Fifty one percent of inter international airlines. I have opted not to transport um, shark fins and some of our biggest shipping companies have also um, opted not to participate in the trade. Next slide. Sharks um, are valuable to our oceans in lots of ways, but particularly in Florida, they're actually a, a big economic driver, which is quite surprising. Um, in 2016, Oceana commissioned a study and we looked at the amount of money um, that shark encounters and shark tourism bring to the state of Florida. And what we found is that um, just folks going to Florida to experience shark encounters. So these are people that just wanna see sharks um, and it doesn't include restaurants and hotels and all that other stuff, just shark encounters. Um, it generated about $221 million in 2016. And when you compare that to um, the entire amount of fin exports from U.S. fishermen, which are barely over a million dollars in the previous year, um, it doesn't even come close. We, we recognize that sharks in the water with their fins attached, swimming around, folks can go see them. Are, are, not only are they providing us an amazing ecological benefit um, by increasing biodiversity, but they're also providing jobs um, and tourism dollars that uh, are, are really important to a lot of business owners. So you're seeing a lot of the dive industry, especially in Florida, being super vocal about this bill. And um, it's been wonderful to, to see that advocacy. Okay, next slide. Um, there's also been an amazing outpouring of support from businesses, dive shops, NGOs, wreck fishing groups, and aquariums that have endorsed the bill. Um, locally, uh, the Clearwater Marine Aquarium, um, with the help of David Yates, um, he was has been really great in helping um, lobby and uh, advocate for this bill with our elected officials. Um, and the Florida Aquarium as well has been, uh, has endorsed the bill. Um, so 
but in addition to that, I mean, just hundreds of businesses and lots and lots of dive shops, especially in Florida, um, have been uh, really, really supportive of this, of this bill. Next slide. Um, we also um, commissioned independent polling and the results are great. <laughs> I mean, they're really great. Eight in 10 Americans support a shark fin ban. Um, I think most people are kind of appalled and they don't want to see sharks go extinct and they recognize that um, that shouldn't happen, especially for the demand for soup and whatever we can do to prevent that from happening. I think um, Americans see the value in that. So good polling um, in support of this bill. Next slide. And so um, the Shark Fin Sales Elimination Act, a very bipartisan bill. Um, you can go to the next slide. H.R. 737 was actually passed in the House of Representatives last year. Um, really fantastic news. Um, I love this little cartoon. My friend Una and Oceana colleague uh, Una Watkins um, did this uh, cartoon. You can find her on Instagram at Una Sees. Um, she does great illustrations, but uh, just in celebration of, of that, that vote, huge milestone for this campaign and this bill. Next slide. Um, and it was just a massive victory, um, super bipartisan again, um, 310 yays to 107 nays. So major, major victory. And so we have moved on um, from the House. Now, I think, you know, we were obviously gearing up for 2020 to get this thing done. Um, and we faced a lot of hurdles as has everyone um, with COVID-19 and, and all the important things that are happening in our country and world. Um, but I think there's still opportunity and reason to be very optimistic to get this done. And Florida is a really, really key place to make it happen. Next slide. Um, Florida is important because we're such a purple state. We have ocean lovers everywhere, coastal communities, um, fishermen, divers, um, and people that get that uh, biodiversity is really great for us. So I think a really wonderful thing that folks can do is call your senators, Senator Scott and Senator Rubio, and ask them to co-sponsor S-877, the Shark Fin Sales Elimination Act. Um, the petition that we're going to share you share with you um, will send an email directly to their offices. But I will like a little tip is calling actually works, and um, you probably get hit up a lot to call your senators. And what I do is I like to save my elected officials' numbers in my iPhone, uh, so I'm not having to Google every time that I need to call. Senator Scott or Senator Rubio. Um, so really important to, to save their numbers um, and you know let them know how you're what what you think. Um, it's emails are great, are good. Um, form emails not as good. Calling is really really important. And if you ever uh, get to meet with staff or with the member themselves, even better. So um, yes, I would that would be wonderful. Next slide. Another great way to stay plugged in to Oceana's work, um, really, I think a, a fantastic way is to, is to engage with us on social media, um, whether it's uh, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Um, we uh, try to post really relevant stuff to our campaigns, um, developments with the Shark campaign or the other campaigns we talked about. We also offer um, events and training series um, two things that I want to plug that if you follow uh, Oceana Florida on our Facebook page or Instagram, uh, the first is a plastic pollution series workshop series where we're training folks across the United States of how to implement and manage a campaign um, specifically related to single use plastics. Um, so if you're interested in that, my email is down there at the bottom, please email me. Um, the second is um, a really great fun activity we're doing for um, for Shark Week starting on August 9th, which is Barks for Sharks. We've done Barks for Sharks in per person for two years, um, but we're gonna do a, a kind of a Instagram and um, uh, 
Facebook version of Barks for Sharks. And basically what we're going to do is folks can, um, there'll be instructions on our, on our social media accounts, but basically it's getting your dog or your pet involved um, in a sharky themed way and tagging um, Senator Scott and Senator Rubio and asking them to pass a fin ban. So that's going to be coming down um, down our social media threads uh, coming up this week. And I really would love to see the pictures of your dogs asking for a fin ban because we really do need it. Um, and I think I think I can stop there. But yeah, it's it's been wonderful. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk about our campaigns and specifically um, the opportunity to talk about sharks and how there's this really big opportunity um, again, um, to pass the Shark Fin Sales Elimination Act. Florida is the way, that's how we're gonna get this done. Um, and we can only get it done with your help. Um, so please give them a call, um, sign our petition, it will email them, um, and then share with your friends as well. Um, it's really easy to access. It's just oceana.org slash fin ban now. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that information. It really is staggering when you think about it. 73 million sharks end up in the global fin trade every year. That is so many sharks. And um, it's it sounds like a really positive outlook, you know, if it's a bipartisan issue and it's as simple as calling your elected official. Um, I'll go back to the slide really quick so people can write down these numbers. If you live in Florida, write them down. Um, get a couple people in your community together to have a little phone call party where you guys are calling um, your senators and telling them why you think that they should co-sponsor S8. 77, the Shark Fin Sales Elimination Act. So that is one of our eco action items. We would like to challenge everybody today to get involved with. Thank you, Hunter, for sharing that. And um, I have from some of our questions, um, I have our new branch manager for St. Pete, Miss Hannah Miller, here to ask some questions. Also, if you have a question and you're tuning in on the Facebook Live right now, um, now's the time to add a comment. Um, so then you can go ahead and see um, you can go ahead and ask your question that you have related to sharks, the shark trade, our oceans, plastics in our oceans um, with Hunter right now. So while we wait for some of those, um, I'll uh, give the microphone to Hannah to share um, a question that she has. Hannah? Hi, hi everybody. Um, I just want to say thank you, Hunter. That was extremely informative. I feel like I learned a lot that, you know, I think like everyone should know, especially living in Florida. Um, so I just wanted to start out by asking you, is there better ways to enforce um, the illegal trade that we're not doing currently? Yeah, so what, what we've seen is over a dozen states have um, instituted shark fin bans, uh, including um, the state of Florida um, did pass in the House and Senate a shark fin ban. Um, with some exceptions, but largely it's a fin ban. Um, the problem with with state bans, while they're awesome, um, is uh, it's really hard to enforce. So um, there's a lot of questions. Um, and you know, for instance, the Port of Miami was the hub of shark fins in the U.S. Um, and so, really, what what ends up happening is um, those imports will just move to, say, Charleston or Savannah. Um, so really the federal ban is going gonna, is gonna to be obviously the most comprehensive, but take all the guesswork out and um, the enforcement is going to be very black and white. Um, and, uh, you know, I think as far as like sustainable shark fishing goes, there it, it gets very tricky because um, when we look at uh, stock assessments of sharks, um, we simply do not know the stock assessments for a huge amount of our shark species um, in our water. So like uh, over 60% of our shark, spe uh, shark species, we have no idea if they're overfished or if they're experiencing overfishing. Um, so it's really, really difficult to know. But I think a very easy way that we can make a big dent in this issue um, and send a message and establish ourselves as leaders in shark conservation is passing the Shark Fin Sales Elimination Act. And, you know, like 
the elephant tusk trade. That was a cruel and brutal practice and those species were at risk for extinction. The US got out of that trade um, and we said, yeah, we, we don't wanna be a part of that. That's something that I think we should be doing here in regards to sharks and um, especially given their importance to, to our oceans. So I know for some other um, fishing laws, um, there's financial incentives put in place for like, um, you know, the good actors to report on people, um, you know, doing anything illegal. Do you think that would be a part of the bill as well? Or do you think that would be successful? Well, I, I do mean like in US waters? Yeah. Well, I think it will be so cut and dry. So it'd be really easy for law enforcement. You know, if you have, if you are in possession of shark, of a shark fin, then you are breaking the law. If you are trading shark fins, then you are breaking the law. So uh, I think a lot of the guesswork and loopholes. So for instance, if, if a shark is landed in Florida and then drives through across state boundaries through states with and without fin bands, it's just like a patchwork of regulations that are inconsistent with each other and it's it just makes it so much more clear cut um so from an enforcement standpoint i think whistleblowing exists whether it's overfishing of any sharks of any species of fish but um having a clear cut in the law is the biggest tool that we can have um uh, so we can hold people accountable Okay, and I'm seeing a, <clears throat> a couple of questions come in. Um, I think this one's from Catherine from how it's showing up in the chat. Um, what can folks do to de-escalate the cultural fear around sharks? Um, in parentheses, is Jaws to blame? Um, you know, I think, um, I think there's a lot of, I've seen a, a cultural shift from of people's view of sharks generally. I mean, like in Tampa, for instance, um, there is a whole convention dedicated to shark lovers. It's called Shark Con. And there's just, it's incredible the thousands of people that show up that are total shark nerds. Um, I don't think that really existed as much as it did um, maybe 10 or t even 10 years ago. I think, um, I think Jaws and some of the other stuff that we've seen um, even in Shark Week, sometimes it can portray them as man eaters or super dangerous. I think the exercise that um, that Devin had us do at the beginning is a perfect example of really how um, sharks are not a threat to humans. We're not on the menu. Um, it's uh, it is they are inherently scary for us because that's kind of like our cultural reference is yeah Jaws, but um, but I think. I think education is really important and science education. Um, and I think like our aquariums and, and certain educators do a really good job of talking about not only the importance of, of sharks, but kind of the realities of, of, you know, them not being a huge threat like we've always known them to be. Can I add something to that too, actually? Please, please. Um, so yeah, everything under said, absolutely, 100% agree. Uh, another thing that I think you can do too to help de-escalate perhaps your own fear around sharks is just get in the water with one and go swimming with it. It's it's an amazing, amazing experience. If you've never actually had the opportunity to go swimming with sharks, it's just, it's it's out of this world. It's, as soon as you get in the water, you realize it's just a fish. It's 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 doing its own thing. You're doing your own thing. And to be in the water with them, it's just it's just such awe. Like your your, your opinion of them is going to change immediately. It just becomes this super graceful, amazing animal that you're in the water with. And, uh, so that that's my recommendation is just try to get over that that last little uh, fear hump that you have and get in the water and uh, go swimming with them. Yeah, it's kind of like immersion psychology where like it's hard there to be go. afraid of something once you're, you know, around it and used to it. Um, and then I'm seeing a question from Jamie. Uh, a large portion of shark finning occurs outside the U.S. Is Oceana doing anything on the international level to assist with ending shark fin sales? So we we do operate in internationally and have independent um, 
staff that works within those functioning democracies. So I'm not really sure if there's active campaigns in those countries. Um, but, you know, the way Oceana in the US works is we work on targeted campaigns to affect US policy. Um, and we try to get those campaign goals accomplished in three to five years. So really laser focused um, that we try to, um, a lot of the international policy, like through CITES or some of the other groups or, or avenues to get international kind of trade agreements um, can take years. They can cost an insane amount of money. And I think what we've done as an organization is identify a policy that's achievable in the US. And we have uh, organized and been really, really um, intentional about staying focused on that, that policy. And I think it would be a great step. Um, I know like Canada just um, um, also just passed the, like basically an identical bill in Canada. Um, and so, you know, we, we, I think this is the logical easiest first step that the U S can take. Um, it will make a difference in the, in the global fin trade. Um, you know, we won't be able to um, transship or we won't be contributing to that, but um, it is really important, I think, that we tackle this on a global scale. Um, however, I think uh, a great, great milestone would be to pass the Shark Fin Sales Elimination Act. And uh, for Oceana, we're laser focused on that. I think it would be a really big win for sharks. Awesome. And then I actually, oh, sorry. No, I, I was actually, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, I have a question. So we know that um, sharks really are part of our ecosystem. And when you take sharks out of our ecosystem, some other animals can be in too great of numbers and start to um, tip the balance of the ecosystem, right? And others can be in too little. Um, I did do some research and I, I read about um, off the coast of California, how there was the elimination of a certain species of sharks. And what they started to see was more of the sea urchins um, have greater populations and destroy um, the environment. Do you have any other examples of that? Um, maybe some that might be more local to Florida um, or other examples of the imbalance when you're taking sharks out of the ecosystem, what happens in return? Yeah, I think generally, um, and we touched on this a little bit, but yeah, that balance of our, of, of the, um, of the uh, food chain, the, the marine food web um, is so fragile. So like I said, like, it does seem like, yeah, there'll be more fish if the sharks are gone, but it, it can really spiral a whole ecosystem out of, uh, out of whack when you start taking out, especially top predators. Um, I don't know specifically that, um, I know there's, there's, there's several studies looking at that. There's actually been some really great studies that have come out this month, um, looking at reefs, um, around the globe. Um, and, and they kind of have seen the absence of sharks where they once were very, very plentiful, staggering amount of reef systems that have no sharks to be found. Um, and that's really concerning. Um, you know, obviously for shark populations, but also for folks that love coral reefs, um, those ecosystems, um, because of those cascading effects um, of the top predator being taken out. And um, I'm not a scientist, I'm, I'm an organizer, but, um, but just knowing the, the basics of like the, the marine food web structure, um, it's pretty, pretty basic to know that the top predators is vitally important for for healthy ecosystems, especially reefs. Thank you. And Hannah, I don't know if you have a final question. Um, if you do have a final question and you're tuning into Facebook Live, please ask your questions now. Um, I think I have one more question I wanted to ask. Um, let's see. I think you answered most of mine. Oh, I wanted to ask about the, um, I think you might have already talked about it a little bit, like how to discourage the global market for shark fin soup since it's so cultural. Is there maybe an information campaign or something even kind of like what they did with like Dolphin Cove? 
for in like I think Japan does that. Yeah, yeah there there are um, there's a documentary for that. <laughs> no, there there are really great documentaries out there um, that go into the issue really really well. There's also like you know Hong Kong is probably the global hub for shark fins. There's been huge campaigns to make shark uh, shark fin soup kind of uncool. I know like Yao Ming was really really big into trying to let folks know that shark fin soup is unsustainable. It's not cool. Um, and really that's kind of, we've seen it that be effective. I think official Chinese state dinners no longer serve uh, shark fin soup, which is actually a really big deal. Um, and the cultural attitudes over there, it's a massive, massive region, but I think they're starting to ship certainly from where they, they have shifted from where they once were. Um, but the demand's still there. Um, and um, I think I think uh, the way that the US has a unique position to do is is to make a big is to be bold on the issue and and you know there's a great success, bipartisan success in the House and the, the Senate has this really easy slam dunk opportunity to pass it in the Senate. Um, so I think um, those are a practical policy that uh, the U.S. Can, can do to have an impact um, and send a message, kind of, this is not right. We're, we're getting out of this dirty, disruptive trade. Thanks, Hunter, and thanks, Hannah. We have a final comment. Um, Jamie shared, in relation to that question, the book Emperors of the Deep notes with the removal of local tiger sharks allows the sea turtle population to boom and therefore sea grass beds start to suffer. So that's a good example too of how when you take out the sharks, what happens in the ecosystem. So thanks for sharing, Jamie. And so um, we're going to move on to the next slide, which is our Eco Action Days. So even though we can't meet in person, we do have some remote Eco Action Days where you can take part. Um, the first one, I'd like to invite Devin to share just some information as he is part of the Keep Pinellas Beautiful team. So Devin, please share. All right, well, thank you again. Um, yeah, so every year Keep Pinellas Beautiful um, does the Great American Cleanup which basically gathers people all around the country into groups and, and cleans up beaches and uh, neighborhoods and things like that. But unfortunately, due to COVID this year, we can't all gather in large groups and do the cleanups. So at Keep Pinellas Beautiful, we've come up with uh, another awesome way that we can all still do cleanups and basically on your own. So for our Eco Action Day, we're actually uh, going to be having everyone do your own cleanup. You can literally schedule and register your own cleanup, uh, whether it's just you or with a couple friends and family, uh, just keeping, keeping the groups very, very small. Um, but you can basically decide where you want to clean up, whether it's your own neighborhood or your local park, uh, whatever it might be. So all you need to do is go to this link, uh, which we can put into the uh, chat box for you, www.kpbcares.org slash 2020-GAC, which is for the Great American Cleanup. Uh, basically, all you need to do is go to that website and click on the link to register. Uh, well, that'll get you in touch with one of the staff members at Keep Pinellas Beautiful, who will get you all the materials you need. You can even pick up uh, supplies if you need them, uh, gloves, trash bags, th things like that. And then uh, basically, you just get outside and do, do your cleaning. Uh, you'll report your data back to Keep Pinellas Beautiful. And then don't forget to share uh, pictures of your cleanup on social media using uh, lots of different hashtags that we have for you here. I think this is a great thing for kids too, to get involved so Absolutely. they can be a part of this. Yes, this is for people of all ages. And then lastly, uh, just to reiterate uh, Hunter's point, this is the the link I think we've shared with you guys as well uh, to do the, the uh, petition, oceana.org slash finban now. But again, like Hunter said, the best thing that we can do is call directly uh, the senator's offices. Um, that will make the biggest impact. Uh, however, the, the more ways we can contact, the better. So this is the online petition right here. Thanks, Devin. And so make sure to follow us on social media. We have an Instagram at ideasforus.stpete. 
We also have our Facebook page, which you might be viewing us on right now. Um, as well, we have a YouTube. So if you search ideas for us on YouTube, you will find this presentation and you will find tons of other presentations that we've had with our Orlando branch and other branches around the world on different environmental topics. So it's really important that we continuously learn about the environment, we learn about these challenges, and we take action when we can. So another reminder, please call Senator Rubio and Senator Scott about S-877, the Shark Fin Elimination Act. Hope I said that right. <laughs> And of course, thank you to our amazing team. Thank you to Hannah Miller, our new branch manager, Devin Frank, Caitlin Swanberg. Um, thank you so much for being par a part of our team. If you would like to join us, um, you can email me at contact at ideasforus.org and I can get you involved with our state pink branch, um, planning these awesome hive events every single month in eco action projects. So thank you so much for joining us, and we hope that you can call your senator about the Shark Fin Elimination Act. Um, you can sign our petition, and you can reference any of the information again, um, as this will be on our YouTube page, um, to get active and to help our sharks of our planet. So thank you so much, guys, and we will see you next time with the Ideas High St. Pete. Bye.